Last time we have seen that a matrix can be written basically, uh, let me draw here the matrix. So we had uh, several uh, rows, right? And then we multiply usually this one by one, one column, all right? And so whenever we multiply these guys, you can see these in, as two types, uh, two different equivalent types of representation. Can, can you see, right? You don't, uh, is it legible? Can you, okay. So you can see basically uh, as the output of this uh, product has been uh, a sequence of like the first row times this column vector. And then again, uh, I'm just, okay, shrinking them. They should be the same size, right? Like, because otherwise you can't multiply them. So you have this one and so on, right until the last one. And this is gonna be my final vector. And we have seen that each of these uh, bodies here, what are these? Uh, talk to me, please. Those are scalar products, right? But what do they represent? What is it? How can we call it? What's another name for calling a scalar product? I showed you last time a demonstration with some trigonomet trigonometry, right? What is it? So this is or the projection if you talk about geometry or you can think about this as an unnormalized cosine uh, value, right? And so this one is gonna be my projection basically of one uh, kernel or my input signal onto the kernel, right? So these are projections. Projection. All right, and so then there was also a, another interpretation of this, uh, like there's another way of seeing this, which was what? Basically we had the first column of the matrix A multiplied by the uh, first element of the X, uh, of, of, this, of this vector, right? So back, uh, element number one. Then you had the second uh, column times the in, uh, second nem, uh, element of the X vector until you get to the last column, right? times the last n element, right? Suppose that this is long n, and this is m times n, right? So the height, again, is gonna be the dimension towards we shoot to, and the width of a matrix is the dimension where we're coming from. Uh, second part was the following. So we said, instead of using this matrix here, uh, instead of, since we are doing convolutions, because we'd like to exploit sparsity, uh, stationarity, and, and, and compositionality of the data, we still use the same uh, matrix here, perhaps, right? We use the same guy here, but then uh, those kernels, we are gonna be uh, using them over and over again, the same kernel across the whole signal, right? So in this case, the uh, width of this matrix is no longer B, it's no longer N, as it was here. It's gonna be K, uh, K which is gonna be the kernel size, right? So here I'm gonna be drawing my thinner matrix, and this one is gonna be K, lowercase K, and the height, maybe we can still call it M, okay? Uh, all right, so let's say here I have uh, several kernels. For example, I may have my uh, uh, cyan kernel, then I may have my, I don't know, green. Oh, let's, let me change, let's put uh, pink. So you have this one, and then you may have a uh, green one, right? And so on. Uh, so, how do we use these kernels right now? So, we basically can use these kernels by stacking them and shifting them a little bit, right? So, we get the first kernel out of here, and then you're gonna get basically, um, you get the first guy here, then you shift it, you shift it, you shift it, and so on, right? Until you get the whole uh, matrix. And we were putting a zero here and a zero here, right? This is just recap. And then you have this one for the blue color. Then you do magic here, you just do copy, copy, and then you do paste. And then you can also do color, see, fantastic, magic. And we have pink one, and then you have the last one, right? Can I do the same, copy? Yes, I can do, fantastic. Sorry, you cannot do copy and paste on the paper. All right, color, and the last one, light green. Okay, all right, so we just duplicate. How many matrices do we have now? <coughs> How many layers? No, don't count the number, like uh, there are letters on the, on the screen. M, K or M, what is it? What is K? The side. <laughs> 
You're, you're just guessing. You shouldn't be guessing. You should tell me the correct answer, right? Think about this as a job interview. I'm training you. So how many maps do we have? M. M, right? So these one here are as many as my M, which is the number of rows of this initial uh, thing over here, right? All right. So what is instead the uh, width of this little kernel here? A, right? Okay. Uh, what is the height of this matrix? What is the height of the matrix? Are you sure? Uh, try again. I can't hear. N minus K plus one. Okay, and the final, uh, what is the output of this thing, right? So the output is going to be one vector, which is going to be of height the same, right? N minus k plus 1. And then, um, it should be correct, yeah. But then how many, wh what is the thickness of this final vector? M, right? So this stuff here goes as thick as M, right? And so this is where we left uh, last time, right? But then someone asked me, you know, then I, I realized, so we have here as many as the different colors, right? So for example, in this case, uh, if I just draw to make sure we understand what's going on, you have the first thing here, now you have the second one here, and now you have the third one, right? In this case. All right, so last time they asked me, if someone asked me at the end of the class, uh, so how do we do convolution when we end up in this uh, situation over here? Because here we assume that my kernels are just, you know, whatever k long, let's say three long, but then they are just one little uh, vector, right? And so someone told me, no, then uh, what do you do from here? Like, how do we keep going? Because now we have a thickness. Before we started with a... Uh, something here, this vector, which had just n elements, right? Are you following so far? I'm going faster because we already seen these things. I'm just uh, re re reviewing. But are you, f are you with me until now? Yes, no? Yes. yes, okay, fantastic. So let's see how we actually keep going. So the thing I just show you right now is actually assuming that we start with that long vector, which was of height, what was the height? N, right? But in this case, also, this one means that we have something that looks like this. And so you have basically here, this is one, this is also one. So we only have a monophonic signal, for example. And this was N, the height, right? All right, so let's assume now we are using a stereophonic system. So what is going to be my domain here? So, you know, my x can be thought as a function that goes from the domain to the r number of channels. So what is this guy here? One dimension. Yeah, x is one dimension in somewhere. So what is this omega? We have seen this slide, the last slide of uh, Tuesday lesson, right? Set of real values. Say again? Set of real numbers are? Uh, omega is not set of real numbers. No, someone else tries. We are using computers. It's timeline, yes. And how many samples? You, you, you have one sample, number, sample number two, sample number three. So you have basically a subset of the natural uh, space, right? So this one is going to be something like 0, 1, 2, so on, uh, set, which is going to be subset of n, right? So it's not r. r is going to be if you have time continuous uh, domain. Uh, what is c in this case? In the, in the case I just show you. So far, what is c in this case? Number of? Output channels. 
uh, input channels because this is going to be my X, right? This is my input. So in this case, we show uh, so far, in this case here, uh, we, we are just using one. So it means we have a monophonic uh, audio. Let's have now the assumption, make the assumption that this guy instead is going to be two, such that you're going to be talking about stereo phonic uh, signal, right? Okay, so let's see how this stuff changes. So in this case, my, uh, let me think. Uh, yeah, so how do I draw? I'm, I'm gonna just draw, right? L complain if you don't follow. Are you following so far? Yes, because if I watch my tablet, I don't see you, right? So you should be complaining if something doesn't make sense, right? Otherwise it becomes boring if I'm waiting and watching you all the time, right? Yes, no? Yes, okay, I'm boring. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, we have here this signal, right? And then now we have some thickness. In this case, what is the thickness of this guy? C, right? So in this case, this one is going to be C. And in the case of the stereophonic signal, you're going to just have two channels, left and right. And this one keeps going down, right? All right. Um, so our kernels, if I'd like to perform a convolution over this signal, right? So you have different uh, samples here, right? And so on, right? If I'd like to perform a convolution, 1D convolution, I'm not talking about 2D convolution, right? Because they are still using a domain, which is here, number one, right? So this is actually important. So if I ask you what type of signal uh, this is, you're gonna be basically, you have to look at this number over here, right? So we are talking about one dimensional signal, which is one dimensional domain, right? One D domain, okay? So we are still using a one D signal, but in this case it has, uh, you know, you have two values per point. So what kind of kernels are we gonna be using? So I'm gonna just draw it. Um, in this case, we're gonna be using something similar like this. So I'm gonna be drawing this guy. Let's say I have K here, which is gonna be my uh, width of the kernel. But in this case, I'm gonna be also have some thickness in this case here. Right? So basically, you apply this thing here, okay? And then you can go second line, and third line, and so on, right? So you may still have like here M kernels, but in this case you also have some thickness, which has to match the other thickness, right? So this thickness here has to match the thickness of the input size. So let me uh, show you how to apply the convolution. So you're gonna get one of these slices here. And then you're gonna be applying this over here. Okay? And then you simply go down this way. All right? So whenever you ap apply this uh, you perform this guy here, the inner product with this over here, what do you get? It's actually a one by one, it's a scalar. So whenever I use this orange thingy here on the left hand side, and I do a dot product, a scalar product with this one, I just get a scalar. So this is actually my convolution in 1D. The convolution in 1D means that it goes down this way, and only in one way, that's why it's called 1D. But I will multiply each element of this mask times this guy here, and then you have second row, and this guy here, okay? You, sum, you multiply all of them, you sum all of them, and then you get your first output here, okay? So whenever I, I make this multiplication, I get my first output here. Then I keep sliding this kernel down, and then you're gonna get the second output, 
third out, fourth, and so on, until you go down at the end. Then what happens? Then happens that I'm going to be picking up a uh, different kernel. I'm going to get, let's say I get the third one. OK, let's get the second one. I get the second one. And I perform the same operation. You're going to get here this one. Actually, let's actually make it like a matrix. You go down, okay? Until you go with the last one, which is going to be the mth, right? The mth kernel. Which is going to be going down this way. You get the last one here. Okay? Yes, no. Confusing, clearing. So this was the question I got at the end of the class. Uh, yeah, excuse me. Yeah. Why does the dot product return a single value and not one for each channel? Because it's a dot product of all those values between. So basically, you do the projection of this part of the signal onto this kernel. So you'd like to see what is the contribution, like what is the alignment of this part of the signal onto this specific subspace. Okay, this is how convolution works when you have multiple channels. So far I show you just with single channel, now we have multiple channels. Um, okay, so, oh yeah. Um, is it possible to, um, like, like to look like for a 2D domain? Yeah, in one second. Right. In this case, since you didn't bat, you're going to lose two. Two values at the top and two values at the bottom, right? One and one at, one at the top, one at the bottom. So you actually lose the first row here, and you lose the last row here. So at the end, in this case, the output is going to be n minus 3 plus 1. So you lose two, one on top. Okay, in this case, you lose two at the bottom. Uh, if you actually do a center, you center uh, the convolution, usually you lose one at the beginning, one at the end. Uh, every time you perform a convolution, you, you lose the number of the dimension of the kernel minus one. You can try. If you put your hand like this, you have a kernel of three. You get the first one here that is matching. Then you switch one, and then you sw switch two, right? So, okay, with five, let's have a kernel of two, right? So you have your si signal of five. You have your kernel with two. You have one, two, three, and four. So you started with five. And you end up with four because you use a kernel size of two. If you use a kernel size of three, you get one, two, and three. So you lost two if you use a kernel size of three. Okay? So you can always try to do this. All right. So I'm going to show you now the dimensions of these kernels and the outputs with uh, PyTorch. Okay? Yes? No? All right. Cool. Okay. Disaster. Can you see anything? Yes, right? Let me zoom a little bit more. OK, so right now we can go, uh, we do conda, activate, uh, activate, and then we have activate, yeah, PDL, right? PyTorch Deep Learning. So here we can just run IPython. Uh, if I press Control L, I clear the screen. And we can do import torch. Then I can do from torch, import NN. Uh, so now we can see, for example, conv, let's have my convolutional, convolutional layer, is going to be equal to nn conv, and then I can uh, keep going until I get this one. Let's say, let's say I have no idea how to use this function. I just put a question mark, I press enter, and I'm going to see here now the uh, documentation. Okay? So in this case, you're going to have the first item is going to be the input channel, then I have the output channels, then I have the kernel size. Uh, all right. So, for example, we're going to be putting here uh, input channels. We have a stereo signal, so we put two uh, channels. Uh, the number of kernels, we said uh, that was M, and let's say we have 16 kernels. So this is the number of uh, uh, kernels I'm going to be using. And then let's have a kernel size of what? The same I use here. So let's have K, or well, the, the kernel size, equal 3. Okay. And so here I'm going to define my first uh, convolution uh, object. So if I print this one, conv, 
you're going to see we have a convolution, a 2D convolution, uh, sorry, 1D convolution, my bad. Okay, so we have a 1D convolution, which is uh, going from two channels, so a stereophonic, to a uh, 16 channels, means I, I use 16 kernels. Okay, the kernel size is 3, and then the stride is also 1. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to be uh, checking what is going to be my convolutional weights. What is the size of the weights? How many weights do we have? How many, how many planes do we have for the weights? 16, right? So we have 16 weights. Uh, what is the uh, length of the, 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 of the, of the, of the kernel? Okay. Oh, what is this two? Channels, right? So I have 16 of these kernels which have thickness 2 and then length of uh, 3, okay? Makes sense, right? Because you're going to be applying each of these 16 across the whole signal. So um, let's have my signal now. It's going to be, it's gonna be equal to torch dot rand, rand n of size, I don't know, let's say 64. Uh, I also have to say I have a batch of size 1. So I have a batch of size 1, so I just have one signal. And then this is going to be 64. How many uh, channels we said this has? Two, right? So I have uh, one signal, one example, which has two channels and has 64 samples. So this is my X. Uh, hold on, what is the convolutional bias size? A 16, right? Because you have one bias per plane, per, per, per weight. Okay, so what's going to be now my convolution of X, the output? Hello? So I'm going to still have one sample, right? How many channels? 16. 16. What is going to be the length of the signal? 62. Okay, that's correct. Six? 62, okay, fantastic. All right, so what if I'm going to be using a convolution with um, a size of the kernel 5? What do I get now? You have to shout, I can't hear you. 60, okay, you're following, so, fantastic. Okay, so let's try now instead to um, use a hyperspectral image with a 2D convolution, okay? So I'm going to be calling now my convolution here. It's going to be my, in this case, is correct. Uh, it's going to be a conv, conv2d. Again, I don't know how to use it, so I put a question mark. And then I have here input channel, output channel, kernel size, uh, stride and padding. Okay, so I'm going to be putting input stride, uh, input uh, channel. So it's a hyperspectral image with 20 planes. So what's going to be the input in this case? 20, right? Because you have, you start from 20 uh, spectral bands. Uh, then we're going to be inputting the output number of channels. Well, let's say we're going to be using again 16. In this case, I'm going to be uh, uh, inputting the kernel size. Since uh, I'm planning to use, okay, let's actually define, uh, let's actually define my signal first. So my x is going to be a torch dot rand, and let's say one sample with 20 channels of height. Um, for example, I guess 60, 128, well, hold on, 64, and then with 128, okay? So this is going to be my, uh, my input, my input da data, okay? So my convolution now, it can be something like this. So I have 20 channels for input, 16 are my kernels I'm going to be using. Then again, I'm going to be specifying the um, kernel size. In this case, let's use something that is like, uh, 3 times 5, okay? So what is going to be the output? What are the kernel size? Anyone? Yes, no, what? 20 cross 16 cross 3 cross 5. No? So 20 channels 3, right? 20 channels is the channels of the input data, right? So you have how many kernels here? 16, right? 
there you go. You have 16 kernels which have 20 channels such that they can lay over the input three by five, right? Thinny, like uh, short, like, yeah, short but uh, large. Okay, so what is gonna be my convolution on X sized? One sixteen, sixty-two, one hundred twenty-four. Let's say I'd like to actually add uh, back the. Uh, I, I'd like to have the same dimensionality. I can add some padding, right? So here there's going to be the stride. I'm going to have a stride of one. Again, if you don't remember the uh, the syntax, you can just put the question mark and you figure out. And then how much stride should I add now? How much stride in the y direction? Uh, sorry, yes. How much padding should I add in the y direction? One, because it's going to be one on top, one on the bottom, but then, then on the x direction? Two. Okay, you're following. Fantastic. And so now if I just run this one, you're going to get uh, the initial uh, size. Okay? So now you have both 1D and 2D. The point is that what is the dimension of a convolutional kernel ensemble for 2D dimensional signal? Again, I repeat, what is the dimensionality of the collection of kernels used for two-dimensional data? Say again? Four, right? So four is going to be the number of dimensions that are required to store the collection of kernels when you perform 2D convolutions. What is the one exactly? Is that like the one is going to be the stride. So if you don't know how this works, you just put a question mark and it's going to tell you here. So stride is going to be telling you you stride off. You move every time the kernel by one. If you add the... For the, for the torch, that's size. The first one means you only... It's the batch size. So torch expects you to always use batches, meaning how many signals you're using, just one, right? So that's our expectation. If you send uh, an input vector, which is going to be... Uh, the input tensor, which has dimension three, is going to be breaking and complain. Okay, so we have still some time to go in the second part. All right, second part is going to be, um, so you've been computing some uh, derivatives, right, for the first homework, right? So the following homework, maybe, you have to do, you have to compute this one. Okay, you're supposed to be laughing, it's a joke. Okay, there you go, fantastic. Um, so this is what uh, Jürgen uh, wrote back in, in the 90s for the uh, computation of the gradients of the, um, of the LSTM, which are going to be covered, I guess, in next next lesson somehow. somehow. Uh, so they had to still do these things, right? It's kind of crazy. Uh, nevertheless, we can use uh, PyTorch to have automatic uh, computation of these gradients. So we can go and check out how this automated gradient uh, works, okay? All right, so... All right, so we are going to be going now to the uh, notebook uh, number three, which is the, yeah, invisible. Let me see if I can highlight it. No, it's even worse. Okay, number three, Autograd tutorial, okay? Let me go full screen. Okay. So, Autograd tutorial, what's gonna be here? Here I just create my tensor, which has, as well, these required gradients equal true. In this case, I've been uh, asking Torch, please track all the gradient computations, uh, the, the, co the computation over the tensor, such that we can perform uh, computation of partial derivatives, okay? In this case, I'm gonna have my uh, Y is going to be, so X is simply gonna be one, two, three, four. The Y is gonna be X uh, subtracted number two, okay? All right, so now we can notice that there is this grad fn, grad fn, fn function here. So let, let's see what this stuff is. We go sit there and see, oh, this is a sub backward. What is it? Meaning that the y has been generated by a module which performs the subtraction between x and, and two, right? So you have x minus two. Therefore, if you check who generated y, well, there is a sub, uh, a sub subtraction module, okay? 
So what's going to be now the grad function of x? And you're supposed to answer. Oh, OK. Why is none? Because they should have written their Alfredo generated that, right? OK. All right, none is fine as well. OK, so let's actually put our nodes inside. Uh, we, we were here. We can actually access the first element. You have the accumulation. Why is the accumulation? I don't know. I forgot. But then if you go inside there, you're going to see the uh, initial vector. The initial tensor we are using is the 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? So inside this computational graph, you can also find the original tensor. Okay? All right, so let's now get the z. And z is going to be my y squared times 3. And then I compute my average. a is going to be the mean of z. Right? So if I compute the square of this thing here, and I multiply by 3, and I take the average, so this is the square part times 3, and then this is the average. Okay? So you can try it if you don't believe me. All right, so let's see how this uh, thing looks like. So I'm going to be plotting here all these sequence of computations. So we started by, from a 2 by 2 matrix. What was this guy here, 2 by 2? Who is this? X, OK, you're following, cool. Then we subtracted uh, 2, right? And then we multiply by Y twice, right? That's why you have two arrows. So you get the same subtraction, that is the Y, the X minus 2, multiplied by itself. Then you have another multiplication. What is this? OK, multiply by 3. And then you have the final, uh, the mean backward. Because it's, why is green? Because it's mean. No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, thank you for laughing. OK, so I compute backprop, right? What does backprop do? What does this line do? I want to hear everyone. Do you know already? We compute what? Gradients, right? So back propagation is how you compute gradients. How do we train neural networks with? Gradient descent, right? Or whatever Aaron said yesterday. Uh, back propagation instead is used for computing the gradient. Completely different things, okay? Please keep them separated. Don't merge them. Everyone, after a bit, they don't, they don't see me. Those two things keep colliding into one mushy thought. Don't. It's painful. Okay. Uh, here, here I compute the gradients, right? So guess what? We are computing some gradients now. Okay, so we go on new page. A is going to be what? What was A? A was the average, right? So this is a one fourth, right? The summation of all those Z i's. Okay? Uh, what, so i goes from one to four, okay? So what is Z i? Z i is going to be equal to three y i squared, right? Yeah? No? Questions? No, OK. All right, and then this one is, was equal to 3 times x minus 2 squared, right? So A, what does it belong to? Where does A belong to? What is the R, R right? So it's a scalar. OK. All right, so now we can compute dA over dx. So how much is this stuff? You're going to have one fourth comes out from here. And then you have, you know, let's have this one with respect to the x ith element. OK? So we're going to have this one. Uh, I plug inside the zi, I have the 3 yi square. And this is going to be 3 uh, xi minus 2 square, right? So this 3 comes out here. The 2 comes down as well. And then you multiply by xi minus 2, right? So far, it should be correct. OK, fantastic. All right, so my x was this element here. Actually, let me uh, compute as well this one. So this one goes away. This one becomes true. This is 1.5 times xi minus 3, right? 
Minus 2, minus 3. Okay, mathematics, okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, what's going to be my dA over dx? I'm actually writing the transpose directly here. So for the first element, you have 1. You have uh, 1 times 1.5, so 1.5 minus 3. You get one minus 1.5, right? Second one is going to be 3 minus 3, you get 0, right? This is 3 minus 3. Maybe I should write everything, right? So you're actually following. So you have 1.5 minus 3. Then you have 3 minus 3. Below you have uh, 4.5 minus 3. And then the last one is going to be 6 minus 3. Which is going to be equal to minus 1.5, 0, 1.5, and then 3, right? You agree? Okay. Uh, let me just write this one here. Uh, okay, just remember. So I'm, we have already computed the back propagation here. I'm going to just print the gradients and then, ta da! Right? It's the same stuff we got here, right? Why did you write it as uh, partial derivative of A with respect to X and transpose? Such that I don't have to transpose it here. Uh, whenever you perform the partial derivative in uh, PyTorch, you get the same uh, the same shape as the input dimension. So if you have a weight whatever dimension, then when you compute the partial, you still have the same uh, dimension. They don't swap. They don't turn. Okay. They just use this for practicality. Uh, the correct version. I mean, the the gradient should be the transpose of that thing. Uh, sorry, the Jacobian, which is the uh, transpose of the gradient, right, if it's a vector. But this is a um, tensor, so whatever. We just use the uh, same same shape uh, thing. I had a doubt whether the, this would remain the same. Like, in case of vectors, I know that... Uh, no, also this one should be flipping, I believe. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think. All right, so, cool. This is like basic, uh, this is basic PyTorch. Now you can do crazy stuff, because we like crazy, right? I mean, I do. I think if you like me, you like crazy too, <laughs> right? Okay. So here I just create my vector x, which is going to be a three-dimensional, uh, well, a one-dimensional tensor of three items. Uh, I'm going to be multiplying uh, x by two, and then I, 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 call, I call this one y. Then I start my uh, counter to zero, and then until the norm of the y is low thousand, below thousand, I keep doubling y. Okay, and so you can get like a dynamic graph, right? The, the graph is based, is conditional to the actual random initialization, which you can't even tell because I didn't even use a seed. So everyone that is running this stuff is going to get different numbers. So these are the final values of the y. Can you tell me how many iterations we run? Uh, so the mean of this stuff is actually lower than a thousand, yeah. But then um, I'm asking whether you know how many times this loop went through. No. no. Good. <laughs> Why? Because you don't know, you the it's random, right? So it's, it's, you know, it's bad question. Um, okay, about bad questions. Next time I have uh, something for you. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna be printing this one now. I'm telling you the grad are. 2048, right? Uh, just check the central one for the moment, right? This is the actual gradient. So can you tell me now how many times the loop went on? So someone said 11. How many? Uh, hands up for 11. Okay, four people just rose their hands. What about the others? 21. 21. Okay. Any other guess? Sorry, yeah, 11. 11. 10. 10. Okay, we have actually someone that has the right solution. And this loop went on for 10 times. Why is that? Because you have the first multiplication by 2 here, and then the loop goes on over and over and multiplies by 2, right? So the final number is going to be the this number of iterations in the loop plus the additional, like, uh, yeah, additional multiplication outside, right? 
Yes, no, you're sleeping, maybe. Okay, I, I told you not to eat before class, otherwise you get <laughs> groggy. Okay, so inference, this is cool. So here I'm gonna be just having both my x and y, we are, we are gonna just do linear regression, right? Linear whatever thing. Uh, the at operator is just the um, scalar product, okay? So both the x and w has, have the requires gradient equal to true. Um, being, this means we are going to be keeping track of the, uh, the gradients and the computational graph. So if I execute this one, you're going to get uh, the partial derivatives of the uh, inner product with respect to the, the, uh, with respect to the input is going to be the weights, right? So in the range is the input, right? And the ones are the weights. So partial derivative with respect to the input is going to be the weights. Partial with respect to the weights is going to be the input, right? Yes, no, yes, okay. Now I just, you know, usually it's this one is the case. I just have required gradients for my parameters because I'm going to be using the gradients for updating uh, later on the, uh, the parameters of the model. And so in this case, you get none. Uh, let's have in this case instead what I usually do when I do inference. So when I do inference, I tell Torch, hey Torch, stop tracking any kind of operation. So I say, Torch, no grad, please. So this one, regardless of whether your input or weights have the required grads, true or false or whatever, when I say Torch, no grads, you do not have any uh, computational graph taken care of, right? Therefore, if I try to run back propagation on a tensor, which was generated from, like doesn't have actually, you know, a graph, because this one doesn't have a graph, you're gonna get an error, okay? So if I run this one, you get an error, and you have a very angry face here, because it's an error. And then it tells you, um, element zero of tensor does not require grads, and does not have a grad function, right? So E, which was the, uh, yeah, whatever the, the, the Z here actually, Z, you couldn't run a back prop on Z because there is no graph attached to Z, okay? Um, questions? This is so powerful. You cannot do this stuff with TensorFlow, okay? TensorFlow is like, whatever, yeah. More stuff here, actually more stuff coming right now. Um, so we go back here, we have inside the extra folder, you have some nice cute things. I wanted to cover both of them, just that we go just for the second, I think. So the second one is gonna be the following. So in this case, we are gonna be generating our own specific uh, modules. So I like, let's say I'd like to define my own function, which is super special, amazing function. I can decide if I want to use it for, you know, uh, training nets, I need to get the forward pass and also have to know what is the partial derivative of the input with respect to the output, such that I can use this module in any kind of you know, point in my uh, you know, code, such that you know, by using backprop, uh, chain rule, you just plug the thing. No? Jan went on several times. As long as you know partial derivative of the output with respect to the input, you can plug these things anywhere in your uh, chain of operations. So in this case, uh, we define my addition, which is performing the addition of the two inputs in this case. But then when you perform the backpropagation, if you have an addition, what is the uh, backpropagation? So if you have an addition of the two things, and you get an output. When you send down the gradients, what does it happen with the, with the gradient? It gets you know, copied over both sides, right? And that's why you get both of them are copies of the same thing and they are sent through one side or the other. You can execute this stuff, you're gonna see here you get the same gradient both ways. In this case I have a split. So I come from the same thing and then I split and I have those two things doing something else. If I go down with the gradients, what, I, what do I do? You add them, right? And that's why we have here the add. And so you can execute this one. You're gonna see here that we had these two initial gradients here. And then when you went up, oh, sorry, when you went down, the two things, the two gradients sum together. And they are here, okay? So again, if you use pre-made things in uh, PyTorch, they are correct. This one you can mess around, you can put any kind of different, uh, you know, uh, forward function and backward function. Um, I think we are out of time. Other questions before we actually leave? 
No? All right. So I see you on Monday and stay warm. Bye bye.